available to all of you? Yes, sir. Okay, good. So, uh, so thank you so much, uh, one and all, for joining us today for this session under Malvia Mission Teacher Training Program. And in today's session, you know, uh, uh, I'll be uh, talking about uh, publication writing and ethics and publication and what are the different studies which we are supposed to take care while writing a good publication because I thought that is a very very important component for anybody who is involved in uh, academia and research. So a brief introduction about myself. Uh, I'm currently uh, working as an associate professor at uh, Indian Institute of Technology BHU Varanasi. And before joining IIT BHU Varanasi, I was working as assistant professor at National Institute of Pharmaceutical Education and Research, Ahmedabad. And before that, I was working as postdoctoral research fellow at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, Baltimore, Maryland, US. So I worked there for four and a half years after completing my PhD in pharmaceutical sciences. So... So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to note it down and we can discuss that at the end of session. So I hope the screen and the slides are visible to everyone. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. So, okay. So, as I mentioned, today's session, I'm going to talk about a topic I think which is beneficial to everyone who is in academia, working as a faculty member, supervising the master students or the PhD students, or whether working with postdoctoral research fellows. So, I think this topic is something which is very, very relevant to everyone. So based on my experience, you know, uh, I have been into research from last like 15, 20 years where I have been involved uh, uh, conducting different kind of research in industry and then followed by in academia and uh, in India and then in abroad as well in different countries. So, so based on my experience, I would like to share, you know, some of the insights and, and I hope it can benefit you all. So <clears throat> as I mentioned, I'll be talking about... Uh, publication writing, what are the strategies, and uh, uh, how to write an effective publication, basically. So my first and foremost gratitude to uh, Mahamana. Uh, I hope all of you know this great personality, uh, Mahamana Pandit Madan Mohan Malviji, who is the founder of this uh, beautiful temple of learning where I'm working today, uh, Panarath Hindu University and IIT PHU. So uh, Malviji has created a BHU uh, way back in 1919 when our country was still under the regulation of Britishers. And recently only uh, BHU and IIT BHU has completed its 100 years of existence. So we recently celebrated our centenary celebration. And in honor of that, government of India has issued this portrait stamp out Shut up the words, centenary year. So, uh, you know, I jump into what is publication, why to write it, and what are the strategies to make sure that uh, you write a good publication, which can be published, you know, in a good journal. There are certain questions which I think one should ask. Why publication writing is important? Second, what are the different types of publications? Mostly we talk about only two types of publication. One is a research article, which is based on some laboratory work, bench work, or some competition work. And next is a review article, which is a compilation of information from the recent research articles, which are published in the last five or 10 years. Then the next question is how to identify the right journal for your manuscript. And then the next important question, I think, which we will answer in today's discussion is, what is plagiarism? 
in today's uh, era when public has become a very important parameter for the uh, growth in you know academics specifically where promotions are based on publications and even you know confirmation of the services are based on you know publications and grant you know so there is a kind of ray among the different people who are involved in research you know to publish more and more in a uh, you know in a definite period of time and as a result of that somewhere you know the ethics which are involved in publication they are getting compromise so as a responsible scientist as a responsible faculty member we should be educated enough and we should be able to teach our students you know what are the consequences if we don't for the uh, ethics and publication so pedagogy is one of the most important parameter which one should take here while working on the publications and what are the consequences that also we will talk a little bit during the presentation then uh, next part which um, i may cover in the second session or maybe you know not today maybe sometime else like regarding grant how to write the winning grants because projects and grant writing they have become very very important to this what if you are in uh, research sometime you have intramural grant where your institute is supporting your research but uh, at many places including not only in india even if you are working in other countries like i have been in us for four and a half years i have seen that you know the getting grants is highly getting highly competitive day by day so if you don't know how to write a good grant and what makes a good grant so that it is fundable then it becomes very difficult to survive in academic research so maybe if you are teaching along with you know like research maybe you can justify your job a little bit but the people who are purely dependent on research for their job for their salary you know for them it becomes very very difficult if they don't know how to write an effective grant how to make the grant proposals more you know uh, attractive and then we will also talk about different funding opportunities in india and abroad and then types of grants we can apply for and then the scientific responsibility of the researcher as a responsible scientist what we should do and what we should not do okay and uh, a natural life would be happy if he had on to answer and never to write this has been you know penned down by the charles darwin so if one just only have to do the experiment and don't have to worry about publication no don't have to worry about you know writing anything you know then what do you think it could have been a better right way but i think publication is very very important whatever you are doing you're supposed to document it so that other can take the advantage of your experience your findings so in science no matter how spectacular the results are the work is not completed until the results are published so one is to get the funding get the grant get your lab established and then do the experiments ask the right questions and after that when when you are done with completing the experiments when so finance with you you have to make sure that you publish those finding in some reputable journal so that it it has an impact you know some positive impact on the society so let's explore some of the main steps which are involved from drafting a rough manuscript until into a polished paper which can be accepted by some good journal so first is planning your manuscript writing so before that the first question which is very very obvious is why to publish one you know it can be very naive question by a student who is just joining your lab as a master dissertation student or a phd student who don't have much idea about publication like they can ask you like why why to publish what is the requirement to publish so it is one of the most important steps involved in the scientific research process and we all know that not for masters degree but at least for the phd degree in india not all the places but most of the places to get the phd degree to get graduate degree you need to publish at least one to two papers in reputed journals which are signed as scopus journal not only in india but in other countries as well if i talk about united states where i worked for four and a half years there also you have to a publish at least one paper in a respectable journal before you get your phd degree 
At the same time, if you're a faculty working in any institute and involved in teaching along with research, so most of the time your promotions are based on number of papers which you have published in that particular period of time. For example, you are an assistant professor and you want to get promoted as an associate professor. So there will be certain bars, certain guidelines which may vary from institute to institute. Like in IITs, we have a bar of around five publications which we have to publish in a duration of three to four years to get promoted to the associate professor. But that is a minimum bar. That doesn't mean that you will be promoted for promotion. So that is the minimal bar you have to. At the same time, at each and every level, where you want to progress from associate to professor, then you need at least 10 publications in your credit. Without that, you cannot be promoted. Again, that is a minimal bar. Sometimes you have to perform much above the minimal requirement. So this is why sometimes one has to publish. So this is because progression because of you know getting the degree but at the same time I think which is not mentioned here publication is important from the point of view that you have done some science some experiments where you have obtained some interesting findings and if you don't findings it's never going to come in the public domain and until your findings are not in the public domain people are not going to learn from it because it's like advancing the science step by step. It's like a piece of puzzle. You are solving one piece of the puzzle and after you, another scientist will come who will review your paper and then will add another piece into that puzzle and then solve the larger problem for the large benefit of the larger part of the society. For example, for treatment of certain this condition. Okay. So that publication is very, very important. Now, the next question is what to publish? It's very obvious. Any findings which are new, if you have found some results which are encouraging and they are novel, they can be published. At the same time, if you develop some methodology, some technique which can be beneficial for people or scientists, you know, that can be published. At the same time, you know, you can always publish some of the review articles or the summaries on some particular subject. So reviews can again be like mini review or a comprehensive review. It can be, which is called a narrative reviews, which are in, in basically, right? they don't have any limits. Some you can also publish a editorial paper, okay? And of course, the manuscripts, which advances the knowledge and our understanding in particular. So this kind of things are supposed to be published. Now, the next question is what not to publish. It's very, very obvious. Again, the reports which have no scientific value, they are of no scientific interest, so they, they are not supposed to be published. If the work is already out of date, for example, you know, today we are living in a, around 21st century where we are talking about the space research, space science, where people are going to Mars, Moon, and other planets. And then if we talk about something, you know, which is like, which belongs to the 18th century or the 15th century. So that is something, you know, if it is not relevant in today's world, why to work in that kind of area, right? So out-of-date work is not supposed to be published and it is of no value. Again, duplications of previously published work. So that's why it becomes very, very important whenever you assign any problem, any topic, or any uh, research work to their students, it is it becomes very, very important that you ask them to review the literature very, very thoroughly. Sometimes students work in hurry and bari, and they don't see the detailed literature, and they come up with some idea, but, and they start working on it. And then after a few months, when you will do the detailed research, detailed review, you found that, okay, this work is already published, similar kind of work. So the work which is already done, which is already reported by someone else, it has no value. No, it is just a duplication or replication of the previously published work. Incorrect or unacceptable conclusions. Sometimes, you know, the uh, findings which are, you know, highly contradictory or they are incorrect because of some technical errors, they are not supposed to be published. But it doesn't mean that negative data cannot be published. Most of the time, what happened in the scientific community if the data is coming positive, if the experiments are working in a well-defined manner, what we have 
hypothesize in the beginning of the uh, you know designing the project so things looks easier and you know they are highly acceptable but when the experiment doesn't work or when the data is other way around you know it comes you know in a positive manner then people think that it is a negative data and this data has no value but this is not the case sometimes negative data is also a very important data which can give you lot of information sometime you know for example you are working on certain disease condition where you want to explore the role of particular protein or target which is involved in that disease and you find out that okay this particular protein is increased in certain disease condition for example you know alzheimer disease which is a disease of learning and memory so there are several proteins which are up regulated means they are increased so you found that okay in the disease condition this protein is getting up regulated but when you treat it those patients with certain drugs the protein levels of that particular marker is not getting decrease so that doesn't mean that this drug may not be beneficial but the only message which you can get from this kind of experiment or data is that this drug may or may not work but buy not this particular pathway maybe with some other pathway but now that is a matter of further investigations so finally you need a good manuscript to present your contribution to the scientific community then the questions which you should ask yourself before you write you should think about why you want to publish your work so you should ask yourself is it new and interesting is it is this work belongs to a current hot topic which you know most of the people or most of the scientific community is bothered about are you working in that kind of area next question which you should ask yourself have you provided certain solutions to certain novel and the difficult problem of the society and next you should ask yourself are you ready to publish at this point do you have the enough data with you is your data is aligning with your hypothesis so once you have yes 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 and yes to all the few all these four questions that indicates that you can now go ahead and start preparing your manuscript for publication now again you can just you know based on these questions you know what i'll try to put in the slide you can decide whether your work is ready for publication or not as i mentioned the outdated work if the work is outdated it is not supposed to be published conclusions which are incorrect in nature duplication of the previously published work under all these conditions that means you are not ready to publish because the work has no scientific interest no scientific value however if you think your results are novel your findings or methodology are innovative and they are adding to the society in terms of benefit or you think there is significant enhancement in the knowledge existing knowledge in that particular field by your work or if it is a up to date review of a particular subject or in particular field and all these cases that means you are advancing a particular field and that means you are ready to publish your work now the next question is you know uh, like what makes a strong manuscript okay now you know that okay you have the experiment you have done the experiment you have the data now you want to publish it but what is what makes a manuscript a good candidate for publication so most important thing is that your manuscript should be written in a language which is very clear useful and the message should be very very exciting and it has to be presented and constructed in a logical manner which allow the readers to easily grasp the significance of your work i always tell my students whenever they come to my lab before you know i ask them to write manuscript of their research work which they have carried out in the lab i always tell them writing a manuscript is just like preparing a movie filming a movie just like in the movie we have the background information about actors actresses you know or the side actors you know and they all come with some you know background some introduction and then the you know it flows in logical manner so that you know the previous steps are connected with the steps which are coming forward in the 
Okay. In the similar manner, when you're writing your manuscript, it has to be written in a manner so that audience, which is a layman, which doesn't belong to your field even, you know, they should be able to understand the message you want to convey them. So all the paragraphs, all the sections, subsections of the manuscript, they should be well connected with each other, one after the other, so that one doesn't feel that, you know, while reading your manuscript that, you know, uh, we are jumping from, you know, like from somewhere to nowhere. So it has to be written in a sequential manner so that audience can feel connected with your work and they should understand what you what you wanted to do in this work and whether you are able to, you know, do it or not based on your findings. All the editors, reviewers and readers, they all want a well presented manuscript from you as the author. Now, what are the different types of articles? As I mentioned in the beginning, we will talk about the different types of manuscript or different types of articles. The first article, which is very common, and most of the researchers or scientists you know, they work on, is the full articles, or you can say these are full-length articles. We also call them original articles. Now, what are the original articles? The original articles, these are the most important papers, and they are often you know, based on the substantial and the significant uh, completed pieces of the research. So you have identified one problem in the society, maybe one significant disease condition, or maybe you want to sort out some bio-waste problem associated with, you know, like or some other waste management if you're working in that area, or you want to develop some new technology, or you want to develop some medical device, whatever you want to do based on your area of research. So you pick that problem, and then you do the experiment, and then once you have the data, now you think that, okay, now the data is good enough to publish in the form of research article. So that is the most common form of publication where you publish your findings, research findings. Now the next form of publication or the manuscript is letters or we also call them rapid communication or we also call them short communication. So as the name indicates letters, letters mean they are short in nature. So they are very quick and early communication of the significant and the original advances. Sometimes you feel that you have some initial data which can be useful to the society and detailed research can be conducted later on, but this is the kind of information which should be published quickly. So that you can publish in the form of letter or a short communication. They are generally much shorter than the full length article. If the full length article is of like, you know, 5,000 words or 6,000 words, the letters are generally not more than 2,000 or 2,500 words, including your figures and tables. Then the next, another common form of manuscript is the review article or the review paper. They are generally a perspective on certain, you know, like area of, you know, again, a matter of discussion. So most of the time review articles are invited one, they are solicited one. So if you're working in certain field from last five years, 10 years or 20 years, you are known for that particular, you know, uh, research area. So editors of the journals, they will contact you as an expert. They consider you as an expert and will ask you to contribute a review article for their journal, asking your opinion on that particular topic. So most of the time they are invited in nature, solicited in nature. But in other cases, the review articles can be uninvited or unsolicited as well. Where you can go to the journal web page and see, you know, what are those journals which are uh, which can accept the unsolicited articles as well. But most of the time, big journals like Nature, Cell, Science, they don't accept the unsolicited reviews. They mostly go with the invited review papers, all the big journals, okay? And they mostly invite the experts in that particular area who are working for their whole life in that particular area, okay? But there are other art, art journals, you know, where you can publish if you think, okay, this is your area of research and you think that you have contributed significantly in the last couple of years and you want to publish an updated review on that particular area, you can contact the journal and tell them that you want to compile a review or you have compiled a review on this area and you want to publish it in, in, in your journal. So 
that is where you know journal can either invite you and then they will ask you to submit your review article then these are couple of publication then there is another type of publication which is editorial review in case of editorial review sometimes uh, uh, they will invite you you know the journal will invite you to put a commentary on some paper some paper is already published maybe in a particular research area and they will ask you to comment on that because they think that you are expert in this area so they will ask your opinion what do you think they will ask you to write in favor or against in against of that you know recent research article published by some other authors okay so once uh, uh, you are done with your article it is your job to self evaluate your work and then you should think whether it is sufficient for a full article or not and if you feel that your results are so thrilling that they should be shown to the audience to the uh, public as soon as possible if you are not sure what to do how to move forward you should ask your supervisor and your colleagues for advice on manuscript type whether it should be communicated as a full length article or we should communicate as a as a letter as a short review sometimes outsiders can see the things more clearly than you because it is my work i have conducted the research most of them it's very difficult for me to find out the mistake in my draft even in the draft or in the work as well right but when it will be evaluated by someone else by my colleague or by my you know uh, uh, you know uh, students even you know sometimes they can find the mistakes more easily in the work because hame jyadatar apna kaam kai bar theek hi lagta hai hame lagta hai hamare kaam mein koi galti nahi hai kami nahi hai we are sometimes more confident about our work but that is not the case so it is always better to get the advice from your supervisors from your colleagues seniors or juniors doesn't matter they'll be able to give you some good suggestions on your work now the next question is how to identify the best journal for your article i have seen many times you know people have this question you know like uh, we have uh, prepared a manuscript we have the data now we don't know where to communicate it so the answer to this question is very very simple nobody want to publish in a journal which takes like 6 months or 1 year to publish the work because everybody once they complete their work it already took their significant amount of time like two or three years in conducting the experiments and then another six months to compile the manuscript right now nobody want to wait for one year or six months to make your article publish and make it online right so everybody want a journal which can publish quickly at least in a month two months or three months time frame so the best way is to you know figure uh, look at the uh, author guideline like what are the criteria like publication time timeline and other things and you can also look at the references actually of which you have referred you know for while drafting your manuscript so the references can tell you the name of journals where they have published the same kind of work because you are also working in the same area so you can pick the name of some good journals from those you know uh, references and then you can review the recent publications in each candidate journal what kind of publication uh, authors have published other from other labs you know and then you find out the hot topics and then there are certain types of articles etc etc you will go through the details that will give you lot of information and you can debate a lot whether this is the right journal then the these are the following questions you know which you can ask is the journal peer reviewed now what do you mean by peer reviewed peer reviewed term is very very widely used when we talk about the publication so peer reviewed means whenever you are submitting your article for publication it is the job of the editor in chief and the editor to assign your work to some of the experts in your area who are sitting in different parts of the world to uh, review your manuscript and give the genuine comments so it's not like that they are giving your paper to your friends and then you know they are reviewing it with bias so peer review most of the time sometimes it is blinded as well when uh, a reviewer doesn't know uh, who is the author and to which lab this work belongs that is the kind of blind review but not all the papers are blind review but some journals they follow this practice but in peer review at least you know the paper is forwarded to the experts in that particular field who are not you know who are not having any conflict of interest with the authors they are not related to the authors in some other way the, in that case only they can review it 
genuinely without any bias now the next question you should ask who is the general audience if you are working for example on a pre clinical work where you are using different animal models uh, developing the models for the disease condition and then giving the drug treatment okay so in that case you are supposed to pick the journal which is pre clinical in nature and for example you have picked a journal which is clinical in nature means the doctors which uh, the doctors are referring to that journal so your work will have less impact there basically or sometimes journal will reject your work they will say this is not relevant to our mm, this is not within the scope of the journal then what is the average time to print this is a very important question everybody want to get the publication out as soon as possible then what is the journal's impact factor that is another important criteria although i don't put much emphasis on the impact factor of the journal because that is something you know which is a highly manipulative parameter these days but in some or the other way we don't have a better criteria to judge the quality of any journal so impact factor of any journal is calculated by the number of citations you know uh, of papers you know which are published in that journal in in last year basically so more the number of citations of papers which are published in that journal more in the last year basically so more will be the impact factor of the journal that means more and more people are citing the publication from that journal so the impact factor will automatically go high but these days lot of other factors are there which can influence the journal's impact factor lot of publishing houses you know they have made publication a big business basically so you have to be careful from that perspective as well that okay so impact factor is important but it's not that important that you should give it a huge weightage publishing so there are many uh, peer review journals which belongs to certain societies like american chemical society pain society neuroscience society so society journals sometimes they are they may not have a very high impact but getting publication in those journals is very difficult very challenging because they are highly neutral they are highly unbiased so they will publish your work only if it belongs to the high quality one now the next important point while submitting your work to journals for publication is that decide on one journal at a time do not submit to multiple journals so this is a big issue in the scientific community right now people don't understand the repercussions and they just want to publish their work as soon as possible in a hurry and bury basically right so they submit their publication in more than one journal at a time so if they hear from one journal quickly they submit the comments and the responses and they publish it and then they withdraw from the second journal this is highly unethical in nature as a genuine scientist you are supposed to submit your work only in one journal at a time and then wait to hear from the referees on the comments if they reject your work then you are free to communicate it to the second journal okay so now these are some of the tools which can help you to identify the right journal for your publication basically i i hope i am audible yes sir okay okay thank you yes sir thank you okay so these are some of the tools you know which can help you to identify the right journal for your publication so this is by elsewhere there are pub other publishing houses as well like taylor francis nature group and others as well so in this case if you go to the elsewhere website you will see there is a tab where you can put the keywords which are related to to your work for example i personally work in the field of neuroscience especially chronic pain so what i can do i can put the keywords like neuroscience chronic pain neurobiology or you know drug development something like that and when i put these keywords i will put it in the you know like search it will give me a list of journals which will be publishing this kind of uh, work basically there's another basically way to find out the right journal for your work where you can copy paste your abstract onto the web page of the elsewhere journal and then you just click on the start matching and based on the content of your abstract this tool will suggest you a list of different journals or there is another way by which you can directly you know search for a journal by putting the name
So these are just different different ways to help you out to find the right journal for your work. But most of the time, people who are working in certain fields, they do have an idea about different journals in their in their field and uh, their categorization as well. Which are Q1 journal, which are Q2, which are Q3. I hope you understand Q1, Q2, Q3. Have an idea about Q1, Q2, Q3? Okay, so Q1 journals are the journals which basically, you know, belongs to the top uh, top quartile, basically. That means top 25% journals in your particular field. That is Q1 journals. Q2 means the next 25%, uh, you know, uh, the journals which belong to the next top to 25% basically category. And then Q3 means the bottom, basically, you know, which is like from uh, 25 to 50 percentile, basically. So in this way, we categorize the journals into Q1, Q2, and Q3 categories. So journal, journals which belong to Q1 category, they are considered as the good journals in that particular field. So it might be possible that in the field of neuroscience, the Q1 category journal may have an impact factor of only maybe, you know, like 20 or 25. But on the other hand, if you talk about other field like pain, for example, chronic pain, so the Q1 journal may only have an impact of around six. So there's a huge difference between impact factor of the journals based on the area of research because impact factor depends upon the number of citations which that journal got in the previous year. So you actually cannot compare the quality of the work by comparing the impact factor of the journal. So that is generally compared with this Q1, Q2 quartile, which is Q1 journal, Q2 journal. So impact factor may be completely different for the, the journal with, from the different field, basically. Okay. Now, again, the same question which I asked you in the beginning, what makes a good manuscript? As I told you, the good manuscript should contain a clear, useful, and the exciting scientific message, which is very, very clear to the audience. Even if a layman is reading your manuscript, they should be under, should be able to understand and assimilate the message you want to convey. It should flow in a logical manner that the reader can connect each and every dot one by one when they are going through your manuscript. You are supposed to format it in a way so that you can showcase the material and the results which you have, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, identified or, you know, which you have obtained in your research in a best possible way. And it should be written in a style that transmits the message in a very clear way cut manner. So it, it don't have to be ambiguous, basically. So you should be able to, you know, put it in a whole, uh, you know, accurate manner so that what you have observed, the same thing you are reporting. You are not, you know, uh, putting over emphasis or you are not claiming big, big and big claims, tall claims. So you have to be very careful about that while putting your discussion and conclusion part. So if you talk about the structuring your article, basically, how to structure your manuscript, so we all know that these are the different parts of the manuscript, starting from the title of the manuscript, followed by abstract, then the keywords, followed by the introduction part, methodology, resultant discussion, and then followed by the conclusion, acknowledgement, references, and supporting material planning, which we also call it supplementary material. So in the coming slides, we will be talking about this each and individual component of the manuscript, how they play a very, very important role and why we should you know, pay attention to all these components carefully while writing the manuscript. Most of the time we don't care about, you know, about some of the, uh, you know, components of the manuscript, like title, which is, we put up emphasis on title, but we don't care about the keywords. Sometimes we don't care about the reference, we don't care about the acknowledgement because we are more focused about the result part and the discussion part. But each and every component of the manuscript has its own significance. Now, if you talk about the effective manuscript title, how should be a title of a manuscript? The first important you know, point that it could be able to identify the main issue of the paper. So whatever, with whatever objective you have carried out this study or this experiment, that title should be able to reflect that. What problem you have tried to solve in this project. Okay. It should be concise. Effective titles or the good titles, manuscript titles, they are not 
too long and they are either not too short. They have to be concise, optimum. But at the same time, they are supposed to be accurate, unambiguous, specific, and complete in nature. We should use a professional language and we should avoid using the abbreviations in the title. This is some of the mistakes which we, many people do. They use the abbreviation in the title as well. But you should note that in title of the manuscript, abbreviations are not allowed even if they are a standard abbreviation. Then title has to be written in a way that it should be able to attract the readers. It has to be short but not too short. And always catchy titles. Catchy means the title which are written in a you know witty manner, you know which are uh, which are able to reflect the problem which has been addressed, but in the words which are you know like more catchy, so that more audience will be attracted towards your work. So just in case some examples for for your understanding, so one has written a you know this uh, title that action of antibiotics on bacteria. Do you think it is a good title? Very simple and very straightforward. But this title doesn't say anything about what kind of bacteria, what kind of antibiotic, what kind of disease they have worked on. So this is never a good title. This is too short and messages highly unclear. On the other hand, the person has modified this title into another form. Inhibition of growth of mycobacterium tuberculosis by Streptomycin. So now here the author is more specific. Now the author is giving a message that we have worked on the myobacterium tuberculum and we have tried to sort out the problem of tuberculosis and by using a specific antibiotic which is streptomycin. So this title is more acceptable. In the similar manner, you know, there's other few more titles, you know, which can be reframed in a more appropriate manner. So you should learn how to make your title more comprehensive, more catchy and, you know, more acceptable to the readers and the reviewers. Now, if we talk about the keywords, you know, before we talk about the apps, we will talk about the keywords, why keywords are important. Most of the time, we don't pay much attention to the keywords. We think that, okay, keywords are just, you know, one word things and we can put it anything, right? But no, that is not the case. If you don't use the right keywords for your manuscript, then what will happen? People will not be able to uh, catch your article from, you know, the ocean of these, you know, uh, articles. There are millions of articles which are present on PubMed, on different search engines, scientific search engines, like Google, Escopas, PubMed, or so on, right? So if you want that, the people who are working in your area, whether it is diabetes, neuroscience, or waste management, or English literature, Sanskrit, or whatever area you are working on, if you want that, people should identify, should be able to, you know, uh, like figure uh, figure out your manuscript, where it is, and what work you have done. You're supposed to use the right keywords so that when they put those keywords, your article should come out on the top as a top choice article, and they should be able to refer your article and read your article and get some learning from it. In that way, you you will also get the recognition because they will cite your article in your in in, in their work. Okay. So citation is another good indicator of a scientist, basically, you know. The more you are cited, that means the more better science you are doing, basically. So agenda, citation, these are some of the parameters of, you know, today's world where we can judge about the scientific quality of the, uh, you know, any you know, scientist. So, uh, and they are also used by the indexing and also abstracting services as well. It should be specific and it should use only established abbreviations. So you should not use any abbreviations which are not, uh, you know, standard in nature. So like DNA is a standard abbreviation, so that can be used in the keywords, basically. For example, just for your understanding, you know, this is the title of the article where, you know, uh, one has worked on experimental study on evacuated tube solar collector using supercritical CO2, right? Now, what could be the different keywords one can pick from this title? One is the solar collector, basically, because they are working on the solar collector. Another can be supercritical CO2, solar energy, solar thermal utilization. So these are the certain keywords, you know, which are relevant to this work. 
and should be used by the authors. In the similar manner, depending upon what area you are working on, you can pick the specific keywords for your work. Now, abstract. Abstract, I would say, to me personally, based on my experience, is the most important part of any research or the review article. This is the soul of the article, gist of the article. Why? Because anybody who wants to uh, refer your work, they will first read the title of your work, uh, article, and then they will read the abstract. So abstract is generally a kind of, you know, whatever work you have done in last two, three years, or your students have done in the last two, three years, right? All that research information you are you are supposed to explain in sometimes 250 words, or sometimes in 300, 350 words. Again, abstracts can be structured or unstructured based on the guide to author of that journal. But again, if the abstract is not written, properly in a more cohesive manner, then sometimes it may not be able to give the exact information about your actual work you have done. So it's very, very important to basically, you know, write the abstract in the most rightful and the attractive manner so that you can compel the audience to go through your research manuscript or the review article in detail to make sure that you compel them that read my full article. But if by reading the abstract, they feel that, okay, this work is something which is not relevant or which is not good, they are not going to read your full paper, basically. Okay? So your work will not have much impact on the audience. Now, in the abstract, you are supposed to summarize the problem, which is very, very important. What problem you have, you have hypothesized or you wanted to so solve, methodology you have used, what are your results? And then what you have concluded from your uh, results, basically. Make sure it is written very clearly and in a language which is very easy to understand. And you also make sure that the abstract is very accurate and specific while also being a little bit catchy in nature. And you are supposed to uh, write, you know, uh, last so accurately refers the content of the paper. This is very important. So this is generally recommended that follow the rule of 10 while writing the abstract of your manuscript. If it is a unstructured or even if it is a structured abstract, you should follow the rule of 10. What is this rule of 10? Out of basically 10 sentences, which is almost 250 to 300 words, starting one to two sentences should be dedicated to the aims and objective of your work in which you can talk about the problem statement. And then next two to three sentences will talk about the methodology you have adopted to address this problem. And the next two to three sentences will be talking about the what results you have to obtain by using this methodology, by performing those experiments. And then the last two sentences will be talking about the discussion on the results you, are, you have obtained and what is the conclusion and the future direction in that particular area. So they will collectively be around 10 sentences which will give a overall, you know, basically view uh, of your research work. Now, next important uh, factor is the introduction, basically, like uh, where you want to, uh, you know, make sure that your audience, you know, uh, is able to understand why you have picked this particular project and how you want to address the problem which you have highlighted. So in the introduction, you are supposed to explain the problem which you want to address in detail. And then you also want to describe your approach, your methodology by which you want to address that particular problem. Okay. And then you can uh, mention the existing solutions to that problem. And you should also talk about the limitations associated with the existing solutions. And then the most important part, how you are going to sort out this problem, making sure that your solution doesn't suffer from these limitations, which are there with the existing solutions. Okay. For example, if I'm working in the field of chronic pain disorders, I will talk about, for example, neuropathic pain, which is because of the 
injury in the mouth of the uh, you know patients it can be sciatica it can be due to some other parts of the body nerve damage right so i will be talking about what is neuropathic pain how many patients are suffering from neuropathic pain or in all over the world especially in india if i am in india right what is the demography in my country and then i will talk about what are the therapies or the treatments which are available for the treatment of neuropathic pain and then i will also talk about what are the problems or the limitations associated with those therapies which are there in the market in the clinic basically and then how i am going to solve out sort out this neuropathic pain problem and how my solution will not be suffering from the uh, this current limitations so introduction is a very very important part where you are trying to you know make a good background you know of your work basically it has to be really strong okay and here you are trying to you have to you know cite the literature from different labs uh, identifying the problem and then justifying it okay then next from the uh, methodology part in the methodology part basically you will be mostly uh, talking about how you are trying to sort out this problem basically you know what techniques you will be using and or you have used basically and uh, you will be talking about the detailed information on those methodology okay so that people who want to uh, work on the similar kind of area they should be able to repeat your findings repeat in the term if they want to confirm your results or if they want to use the similar kind of methodology to answer some other question they should be able to do that after reading your paper so methodology is a very very important part sometimes people do the malicious things you know by for example uh, i i came to know from some people who are working in the field of chemistry you know who are synthesizing the drug molecules for the treatment of different disease sometimes they don't disclose the small small point like while proposing how they have synthesized particular molecule somewhere they will miss the temperature condition somewhere they mention uh, they do not mention the ph condition or the humidity so those small small things you know will lead to the complete changes that reaction will never go on and that desired molecule will never get formed so sometimes people do it intentionally you know because they don't want others to uh, you know copy their work but i think that is not right the most important thing is that the methodology should be in detail with all the key information small small information so that if others want to repeat your experiment they should be able to do it accurately without any ambiguous and do not describe previously published procedures but cite them clearly okay if you are just following some other methodology you should you can just avoid even talking in detail and then but you have to cite it and always cite the original papers there are certain methodologies you know for example they have developed by the original innovators maybe 10 years back and 20 years back so everybody you know who is working on that particular model they are citing that original paper so you are supposed to give the due credit to the innovators of that particular technique if you are using the same technique in your work so in scientific community in science it is very very important to give the proper citation to give the due credit to the authors of the work okay and then you also have to identify the name of the equipment and not only name but also the make and the manufacture of the equipment and also the materials if you are synthesizing some molecules and drugs you should give the name of each and every chemical like hydrochloric acid sulfuric acid or you know benzene or anything else whatever you are using so along with the chemical name you are also supposed to mention their manufacture whether you have purchased it from sigma elrich or albiochem or some other pharmaceutical company or any chemical manufacturers then uh, you also have to mention the proper notations including the chemical formula and the symbols basically okay that is also becomes very important and don't forget to present the controls use while designing any experiment controls are very very important that suggest about the robustness of your study how robust your experimental design is if you are using the proper control then whatever data you are obtaining will be more reliable so 
those details are supposed to be there in the method of the part itself. Now, next is the result section, which is very interesting part of the manuscript. And most of the people are very careful about it as well, because this is where they are trying to, you know, put, you know, their data in front of the audience. And uh, what do you see in this picture here in the bottom right? It's a big ocean with a big iceberg, you know, and with one portion of the iceberg outside the ocean, outside the sea, and which is like 10 to 20 percent of the actual iceberg, which is below the ocean. So what is this tip of the iceberg? This is actually the data which we call as primary data or the data of primary importance. Because most of the journals, they have page limit. So they cannot allow you to publish 20 figures or 30 figures, right? But whenever you are doing research, whenever you are doing science experiments, you have to do so many experiments to address, you know, some concerns, right? But for that, you know, you have a lot of data, but journals have some page limitation. So they will ask you to categorize your data into two parts. One is the data of primary importance and data of secondary importance. So the data of secondary importance is actually the large part of the iceberg, which is actually beneath the ocean. So this is all the supporting data on which your main data holds. So without the supplementary data, main data doesn't have any value. So it generally goes into the supplementary file, which is also published along with the main publication. And people who are interested in your work, they can go through the supplementary file, which is also attached with the main, main publication. And it is available online on the journal web page. And we call this data as a data for data of secondary importance. And then you can use the headings to keep the results of the same type together and avoid the redundancy. It is very, very important how you're putting your data into the manuscript, whether you're putting in a more elegant manner, more, you know, manner which is easy to grasp, easy to understand, and or you're confusing the audience, you know. So it has to be done in a very elegant manner. You have to use the figures and the table for better clarity to the audience because pictorial representations are always much better than the text. If you're writing your data in the form of a lot of text, basically, nobody has that much time that they're going to read the one full page, one full paragraph. So it's always better that people convert their data into pictorial representation in the form of bar graph, sometimes pie chart, sometimes line graph, sometimes scatter plot, different types of, you know, pictorial representation. Sometimes they present it in the form of table, which is very easy to understand to read uh, pictographs. So you may take maybe 10 minutes of 10 minutes to read the full paragraph, but the table and the figure you can just understand in one or two minutes if it is presented in a more uh, you know clear manner. And then the most important part is the statistical analysis. Without a statistical analysis, no data has any value. Okay. So use the proper statistical tools, like which test you have to use, you need to have the sound knowledge of the statistical analysis. Now, next is the visualization of the data, again, which is related to the presentation part of the data, how you are supposed to present your data. So whatever I'm telling you right now, it is not only relevant for the publication, but this is also relevant while you are making some reports, you know, for your for submission in, you know, uh, to, to, to some, you know, uh, authorities or, you know, for uh, uh, like project writing as well. So, so this is relevant in most most of the you know places including publication so the caption and legend are supposed to be self explanatory now what is caption what is legend so legend is the basically title which is mentioned at the bottom of the figure for example here if i talk about this figure you know so here it is not mentioned basically but yeah something like that you know so this is the caption of the table which is table 1 effect of aeration growth of stud bicep you know, polycolor. So similarly, you know, there is a title like, for example, effect of drug A on the hair, hair size or the hair particle, something like that. So that will be the legend of the, the particular graph. So, okay. So they has to be self-explanatory so that 
people can understand what this figure is about. So that figure should be a standalone unit without getting, getting into a lot of intake cases and you know details. And uh, use color only when they are necessary. You have to make a balance between visual versus the spatial. It, the figure should not be too crowded. If the figures are too much crowded, nobody is going to appreciate that. That is going to be a poor presentation. As I mentioned, graph should be uncrowded, restrict data set, use symbols to distinguish. Like if two data set, if they are different from each other, you can use the symbols like at the rate, star, hash, those kind of symbols to uh, identify the significance between one group than the other group. Then you are supposed to mention the proper access labels like, you know, this is a year-wise presentation starting from 1970s until 2015. So people will understand, okay, this is the data which is talking about the, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, the capacity growth basically, you know, over a period of time. And then uh, label size, then a scale marker, and it's very, very important. If I talk about this image, basically, right? This is a microscopy image, right? Which is taken by some instrument. It can be SEM, TEM, or, you know, confocal image, or any histopathology image. In this kind of data, the scale becomes very, very important. You are supposed to mention the scale, whether it is 500 nanometer, 10 microns, 20 micron. So it becomes very, very important. And it has to be exactly the same what you have done. Otherwise, your data will be considered as manipulated data. Now, results. When do you need a table? This is very important to understand, you know, by looking at your data, whether this kind of data needs a table or it doesn't need a table. Just look at this table, uh, this paragraph, basically. Here, an uh, author is talking about, you know, like some task where they are talking about significant activation cluster in the left middle frontal gyrus, which is the region of the brain, and then it is extending to the inferior frontal gyrus, and then there are certain readings, this, that. So you can see 10 or 15 different kind of readings, which is talking about the activation of the different brain regions and how they are related to each other. So this kind of data definitely needs a table because one doesn't have time to read, go through it and also it looks very complicated and difficult to understand. So if you present this kind of data in the form of table, table the, the uh, reader will be able to understand in a much you know, easier manner. But if you look at this data basically, which is presented in the form of table, where uh, authors having uh, testing, tested the effect of aeration on growth of streptomyces colicolor. So here they have used just one temperature, 24 degrees Celsius. They have done the same kind of experiment and they found that in uh, aeration of growth medium, one time it is plus, one time it is minus, and then 78 and zero. So this kind of data is very simple data, which can be just presented in one or two lines. So this kind of data doesn't need a table actually. It can be just written in one line. Growth medium aeration was essential for the growth of S. colicola. At room temperature, in stationary culture, bacterial growth was not measurable, whereas in aerated culture, substantial growth was evident. So this kind of data can be explained in one sentence or two sentences at the most, and no need to put it in the form of table because table will occupy more space otherwise. You have to be smart enough to understand to present your data in a way so that it is easy to understand and it occupies less space in the journal, uh, basically. Now, the next important part of any manuscript is the discussion section, discussion part, basically. So, how this discussion part is important? In the discussion part, you are basically interpreting the results which you have obtained and you are trying to basically correlate your data with the already published results from other labs. And then you compare it and then you talk about the uh, like pros and cons of your findings, whether it is aligning or it is not aligning. And then you compare the published results with your own results, basically. Okay? And uh, while writing the discussion part, you, you have to understand that you, you, you need to avoid the statements that go beyond what the results can support. So you cannot make tall claims, big claims, which are beyond your results and finding. You have to be very generous in and, and, and understanding, you know, like what you have actually obtained in the findings, in the results part, 
and then you know you should you should you know only you know claim that much not more than that and again you know when you are claiming something you should use the terminologies which are very you know uh, uh, you know not very you know confirmatory in nature like drug x may treat the alzheimer disease you should not say that drug x uh, will uh, will treat the alzheimer disease how you can say it confirmatory it is just a result uh, uh, a study where you have obtained some findings and you think that it may work or it may not work so while making the claims you have to be uh, you know be you know very smart like how you're claiming and then you should not use the non specific expressions and then new terms not already defined or mentioned in a paper that should be uh, highly discouraged to 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 use in the discussion section you cannot introduce any new terms suddenly in the discussion part if it is not the part of the introduction and the methodology you can avoid speculations on possible interpretation that are not rooted in the facts so talk on the facts talk on the findings what you have obtained that is what science is you are not supposed to talk something else most of the you know authors and the people laughs they do this mistake you know we were discussing it just last last week my postdoc supervisor from john hopkins in us he was visit he has visited india so he was in varanasi just like few days back you know, last last week and we were discussing on the same problem most of the people when they are writing their manuscript they have obtained something else in the result part and then in the discussion part they're concluding something else so that makes a poor manuscript poor paper basically and it is no way relevant to your findings actually so don't hesitate to highlight the limitations of your study as well none of the study is perfect everybody has a limitations but if you are highlighting your own limitation that talks about the genuineness and the integrity of your work and always talk on facts what you have obtained conclusion very important part of your manuscript where you will talk about how your work has advances the current state of knowledge in that particular field here you are not supposed to repeat the results or you are not supposed to repeat the abstract part of your manuscript because here you will only be talking about the uses or the you know the extensions or the application part of your work basically like how this particular findings which you have obtained will add up to the existing knowledge and where this field will move in the next 5 or 10 years and how it can benefit the society you can also suggest the future experiments again you have to be very very clear in terms of you know like uh, uh, to help the reviewers and editors to judge the your work and its impact acknowledgement section basically again you know people don't you know uh, basically uh, you know worry much about the acknowledgement section they think that uh, okay we have done certain work and here we just have to acknowledge you know our institute and the funding agency but you should understand you know whom to acknowledge and whom to give the space in the acknowledgement section whom to give the authorship sometimes people you know don't understand if some somebody is helping you to proofread your manuscript you are giving them the authorship that is not the right ethical way to do it that is highly unethical in nature if somebody has helped you in proofreading your manuscript or even in doing some corrections or typing of your manuscript that never deserves the co-authorship that will always go in the acknowledgement section because they have not contributed scientifically in your work so the people who has contributed scientifically only those people uh, or they, they, they will be the part of the authorship basically others will come in the acknowledgement section okay those who have those who have helped you basically right you want to so that they can help you again right so advisors financial support or like funding agency or your institute has supported you financially in terms of you know a uh, funding intermural grant or the equipment infrastructure lab space your head of the department or the director vice chancellor whoever right and then the proofreaders typist there are you know like big institute abroad you know i have seen that they have you know the scientific you know uh, writer they have in every institute you know so unfortunately that position is lacking in india maybe in coming years maybe in next 5 years and 10 years 
that position may come up in Indian institutes as well. But as of now, we don't have that position. So what they do basically, their job is to make the corrections in your manuscript because there are big, big scientists, you know, who have language problem. They do very good science, but they are not very good in writing, basically, English. English may not be their native language, especially in, in a country like America, which I are, you know, who have given you certain gift sample, like some chemicals, some cell lines, they can also be a part of the acknowledgement section. Okay. Now, references is one of the most important part, which, you know, one gives least attention, I would say, because everybody takes references for granted. They think that, okay, these are the references, you know, we have referred in our work, and they are at the end of the document. And most of the mistakes are always found in the references part of any manuscript, if somebody pays the attention. It is one of the most annoying problem, and it causes a great headache to the editors and the journals, basically. So your job is to make sure that you're using the right tools. These days, we have the good softwares, you know, which are available online. Some are the free version. Free version may not be the updated one, but you can get it, you know, from online sources like reference works and note, or you can purchase it basically. Trial version initially, and then you can pay and purchase it. Or maybe sometimes your institute can also purchase it, right? We have some of the, you know, softwares in IIT BHU also. So when you are using these tools and softwares, they will automatically, you know, align your references as per the guidelines of the journals. Every journal have their own guideline of citing the references. Some journals, they cite the other works in between the text with the last name of the author, like Tiwari Atal 2024. But some journals, they do not sign, cite this way. They will cite in a numbering manner, like one, two, three, four. So they have different style. So depending upon, you know, the journal guideline, your software will help you to, you know, align your references in the text and at the end also, you know, whether year will come before or a title will come before, that will be based on the journal guideline. You can just tell the software which journal guideline you want to follow and it will do that job automatically for you. But again, at the end of the day, you have to cross-verify it. You cannot, just, you cannot just blindly trust the software. Most important thing, you know, cite the relevant publications on which your work is based. Do not cite too many papers. Sometimes people have done some research work. Any good research article should not have a references of more than 50, I would suggest. Most of the time, people are citing like 100 references, 200 references for the research article. This is a research work. This is not a review article. If it is a review article, the references can go up to 100, 150, or 200. But for review, it should not be more than 200 even. For a good, you know, length review, like 5,000 words review article. But for a research article, good research article, full-length article, the references should not go beyond 50, 40 to 50, or not more than 60. That makes a poor manuscript. That means you're just citing a lot of literature without having much novelty or without having much, you know, data on your work. Most important, do not inflate the manuscript with too many references, as I mentioned. Another important point, avoid excessive self-citation. That is one of the major issues in today's world. People are just running in the rat race of this citation, H index, number of publication, without realizing, you know, these parameters are helping them today, and they're going to be a big problem for them in coming days. The days are not far. Maybe in the next five years or 10 years, some kind of tools are already there actually. When funding agencies or the institute will start using the tools to find out out of your total citations, how many belongs to the self-citation, how many belongs to the actual citation by the other authors who doesn't belong to you in any way. So always avoid self-citations. That doesn't mean that you should not cite your work. You definitely cite your work, but the work which is really actually relevant to that particular, you know, uh, publication or particular work. Sometimes people are want to increase the citation by citing 20 papers, 30 papers from their previous work. That's not good. And that is very clear, you know, from when you see it. Then avoid access to citation and publication from the same region as well. That should also be avoided because people are doing science in different parts of the planet. So why you want to cite some work from only some specific region like Asia, Pacific, or Europe, or America. So give it a global coverage. 
these are the uh, softwares like reference manager and note which you can follow basically okay while doing the work so uh, i think uh, uh, we will just stop here and we will take a quick break and then we will uh, join maybe around 5:30 to continue after that so where we will talk about you know like uh, so this is all about like you know what are the different components of the manuscript and then after you are done with writing your manuscript what to do after that like how to submit it how to you know move forward how re how reviewers will take it you know all those things you know we will discuss in the next session of the uh, uh, presentation so we'll take a quick break of you know uh, like maybe uh, 10 15 minutes and then 5:30 we will come back if you have any, any specific questions for me uh, please let me know i hope i am audible to everyone yes sir okay okay uh, uh, good evening sir good evening. it is a really uh, very uh, wonderful paper and uh, we have lot of things we came to know uh, sir uh, one thing i want to clear this way yes please ask very uh, clear it uh, you have discussed about the peer reviewed journal so uh, right now the more emphasis is uh, given, uh, was given on the um, ugc list uh, uh, care listed journal so uh, how to search them locate them specifically in our discipline as i belong to the political science mm -hmm. the social science discipline and our way of uh, means we are more working on the theoretical dimensions so what should be the criteria for locating them so i think uh, what i understand from my experience you know the journals which are you know scopus index and you know uh, uh, they're listed you know uh, as a scopus index you know even if they don't have a citation so those journals basically you can, you know, go for. And there's a list of UGC care journal actually, you know. So that list also you can refer, you know, if it is if it is recommended, you know, in your, you know, like community that, okay, you should go for the journals which are in UGC care. So I think that is already mentioned there. So so you can pick from there. But if it is not helping you out, then as I mentioned, you, know, you should look into the journal web page, whether it is Scopus Index or not. Because if any journal is Scopus Index, that means it is a good journal. Sir, sir, no, actually we have discussed about two, three points now that uh, the particular timing, uh, the, the time or the oh, so several things are not there, very much clear. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, we have that, yeah. Yeah, uh, in the UGC care list, we have the lots of journal, but how much duration they will take, what uh, even yeah, sometimes yeah. what happened now, the, uh, right. if we send a paper, they doesn't give that, they, even they are rejecting, we don't came to know yeah, how to yeah, sort yeah, out yeah. this problem. <laughs> that is my question. Yeah, yeah. You, you are right, Dr. Manisha, actually. So that is a big issue, you know, right now. Many journals, you know, they don't behave responsibly, actually. So uh, even I face the same problem. Uh, when I was doing my PhD, you know, uh, so uh, one of our professor, Professor, uh, you know, Srinivasa, you know, uh, uh, Kulkarni, basically, he always suggested that, you know, we should always uh, publish, you know, in the uh, Indian journal, uh, in, along with, you know, uh, like foreign journal, we should also publish in the Indian journals as well. But the problem with the Indian journal, madam, is that sometimes they don't respond to the authors timely. I will just give you one example. I have recently communicated, you know, one of our work in Indian Journal of Pharmacology, which belongs to our area of research. And it's been like eight months, and I have not heard anything from them, even after putting multiple reminders. So, so that is the problem, which is there, and we should accept it. But what I would suggest as an author, because we want to publish our work, if the editors or editor in chief they are not responding to your emails, so you can you know go to the general uh, you know online web page. There is a tab where you can write to them, addressing your problem. That is the problem we are facing. You are not responding. You have not heard from the reviewers. That is one thing you can do. Second, you can directly get the email ID of the corresponding author. There generally there are two email IDs. One email ID which belongs to the editor in chief. You know as the editor in chief of that journal. Second email ID which belongs to their personal affiliation. For example, he's a professor in some institute. So get both the email IDs and write to uh, the editor-in-chief along with other, you know, like editorial manager people, you know, in CC, addressing your concern. And most of the time I have seen that this has worked out. So, but if it doesn't work out, then uh, I think we are free to, you know, withdraw our manuscript from that journal. I, then I don't think that journal deserves our work. There are plenty of other journals we should, you know, look after. Thank you. So I think there is one more question from Dr. Nitu Thiali. 
uh, in the tools where we may put the content of website to search different journals will you name so it, it just the elsewhere tool you know for any journal basically you just go to the uh, elsewhere and i'm sure elsewhere is a big search engine and it has the uh, uh, journals which belong to the humanities background as well so you just go to the uh, that elsewhere tool and you just copy paste your abstract it will give you the journals which belong to the humanities you know great right. or you can also put the keywords even that can also help you so okay yeah uh, if you don't mind we can just take a quick break of like 10 15 minutes and then uh, right now it is 5:23 so we'll join back at uh, 5:40 for the uh, next session if you have any question just keep it you know for the end of second session thank you
So a very good evening. Welcome back to everyone. So can we uh, continue with the next session? Okay, so uh, Dr. Razav is asking, you know, uh, regarding a platform where we can obtain foreign thesis or synopsis. Uh, sorry, sir, I'm not aware of any such platform which can provide you the foreign thesis or synopsis. But I know if you want to uh, get the for, uh, like Indian thesis, there's a web page, uh, Shod Ganga, where all the PhD thesis, you know, or the research thesis, research work is uploaded. It's a guideline, mandatory guideline, you know, by government of India, where everybody has to, you know, uh, upload their thesis, Shod Ganga. So there you can get the, at least the thesis which are of Indian origin. But I am not aware of any such platform which can provide you the foreign thesis or synopsis. But you can just Google, you know, sometimes some theses are available online. So if you want to search a thesis related to your particular field, you can just uh, put it on Google, you know, so you can get some content, you know, online. But a specific website, I, I don't know, sorry. Okay, so we will continue with the next session. Okay, so, so far we have discussed about uh, like uh, what makes a good manuscript, what are the different components of the good manuscript, and uh, now how to identify the good journal, and then we also discussed a little bit about the plagiarism. Plagiarism is a very important part, you know, which I'm not discussing separately in this talk, but I will just talk briefly you know, about it. Uh, this is the biggest issue these days, especially uh, in the days of, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning where, you know, students want to find out a easy way of, you know, preparing a manuscript, you know. Recently, we encountered, you know, one publication which has been published in a SQL journal and uh, it has a phrase from the, like, you know, the chat GPT basically where somebody has asked, you know, chat GPT to write the abstract and introduction for the author. And Chai GPD has written that, okay, here is the introduction what you asked me. So it has been published as such. You can just imagine what a big blunder it is, you know, that it has been, you know, ignored by the authors who have just used the Chai GPT to write the manuscript. At the same time, it has been ignored by the, you know, the, the reviewers and the editors as well. What a big shame. So these kind of things are bound to happen when people don't know how to use that technology in the rightful manner and how to educate our students, you know, to follow the ethics and the morals while doing the research as well. So plagiarism is a big issue and it can come in any form, uh, whether it is like in form of uh, writing the content of the articles for the people who are mostly, you know, uh, uh, involved in the computation or the theoretical work. So sometimes people are copy pasting the content without realizing that it has a lot of similarity with the already published work. So there are tools and software these days. In our institute, we have the subscription with the Turnitin. Turnitin is one of the software which can help you to tell how much of the content which is present in your manuscript research or review is similar to the already public content, wherever it is published in all over the world in any kind of journal. So Turnitin will help you to identify that. So if there is similarity, more than 10%, it is recommended that it, it should be decreased further to less than 10%. It is not considered cause. But sometimes students are coming up with manuscripts which are having similarity index of more than 50%. That means if there are 5,000 words in the manuscript, then 2,500 words are copy pasted from the other's work. So this kind of things are highly unethical and unacceptable in the scientific world. So as a teacher, as a faculty, we are supposed to educate our students to, to, to uh, uh, you know, improve their writing skills and try to write the, you know, content in their own language instead of just copy pasting the content. Sometimes people are using the two AI tools. That is fine. I don't say that it is wrong to use some of the AI tools, but use them judicially 
responsibly and in the rightful manner so that blunders should not happen. Okay. And this is just regarding the content, the scientific content, you know, writing part. Many people, you know, they, they do the experiments and there is data which is related to the imaging. For example, with the confocal microscope, they are taking some images, they are preparing some particles, nanoparticles, or, you know, they are preparing some kind of formulations which they have to take the image, they have to measure their particle size or morphology by using the same time and other equipment, basically, right? So... Excuse me, sir. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, actually, the uh, references uh, slide is showing. I just thought that uh, it is there, no? Sorry? Uh, yeah, yeah. You... yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You're right. So the, the content I'm discussing is not in the slide, actually. I'm talking about the plagiarism basically right now, right? So that is okay, sir. Thank that you. is that is not here. I'm just I just want to appraise you regarding this plagiarism, you know, issue. Because most of the time the students are not aware about it basically. So don't try to correlate it with the content which is on the slide. It is not in the slide, okay? Yeah. So thank you for pointing out. So so yeah, so we have to be very careful while generating our data and while you know uh, putting it for publication. Make sure that the students are not playing with the data, they are not manipulating the images. And they are not copying the images from the other publication. That has happened in the past. We know several cases where people have, you know, taken the images from already published paper and they have put those images in their paper and then publishing it as a new data. It's an academic crime, basically, which one should not do. But yes, as a faculty, as a professor, it is our responsibility to uh, uh, morally, you know, educate the student to tell them, you know, what is right, what is wrong, what to do, what not to do. And at the same time, it is our responsibility to make sure that our manuscript should be free from this kind of malicious, you know, data and the fabrication kind of things. Okay. So next, after you are done with writing your manuscript, the next part, which is, again, you know, very, very challenging and very, very important as well, is submitting your paper to the journal for publication. Now, it's a big question where we have to submit. We already discussed that, right? Now, before you plan to submit your manuscript in the public, in the journal for publication, you have to revise it. So, once you are preparing the first draft of the manuscript, uh, especially a student who is a beginner, the student might be very happy. Okay, I'm done with the work. I have done two years or three years of hard work. Now, my manuscript is ready. I can publish it. But here comes a disappointment. When teacher, the faculty or the supervisor of the student, they do a lot of corrections on their work. They, you know, uh, like cut fit everything in their manuscript and then they return to it. The student get like frustrated, okay, what is this? You know, I have done a lot of work and then there's a lot of corrections. Like you can see there's a lot of red lines. So sometimes, you know, these corrections can go on and on. I can still remember when I joined Naipur Ahmedabad after returning back from United States. So the first PhD student which has been assigned to me in 2016, you know, that time, you know, uh, I have been asked to work on his two review manuscripts, which he has, you know, written. I was surprised to see the manuscript, which is in a very raw form and has a lot of, you know, uh, you know, concerns related to the grammatical, typographical, and also the quality of the content. So I personally, you know, made that manuscript to revise 25 to 30 times before we make sure that we submit it to the journal. The student was frustrated in the process, frustrated in a way. He was kind of, you know, like, why we are revising too many times? But in that process, the manuscript has came into a form which is like highly polished and it was accepted in just one go without any major revision, major corrections. So that happens when you actually, you know, work out thoroughly on your manuscript spend a lot of time. So it's up to you whether you want to spend a lot of time in the beginning before submitting or you want to spend a lot of time after, you know, review rejected. So it's better to spend more time in the beginning itself and bringing to the level where it can be accepted by the journals. So it, it is a tedious process, like corrections and then, you know, uh, revision, correction, revision, corrections. And finally, you know, it will take, and then supervisor approves, now I think they will say that just go ahead and turn it in to the journal. Another important part of any, uh, you know, article submission is a cover letter to which most of the people don't pay much attention. But this is a chance where you have the chance to speak directly to the editor regarding your work. 
So you can just uh, review or view uh, a cover letter of your manuscript as a job application letter, just like you write a application to a you know manager or to a person for your job. In the similar manner, you want to sell your work to the journal, and you are writing a cover letter. It's very important what you are writing there. So here you are supposed to talk. Why did you submit the manuscript to the journal? So in the cover letter, you are not supposed to summarize your manuscript. You are not supposed to repeat the abstract. Those are the work related things. Basically, what you have done, what are the findings, but you just want to make sure that what make your manuscript so special that the journal should be interested in your manuscript. You need to highlight those parts in few sentences. You are supposed to mention the specific requirement like. If you do not wish to review a manuscript as some reviewers, reviewers who have some conflict of interest, that you can also mention in the cover letter. Most of the time, you know, editors will not reject a manuscript only because the cover letter is bad. But definitely, a good cover letter will accelerate the editorial process of your paper, basically. Okay, so let's see. Okay, now we talk about the conflict of interest. Why conflict of interest is important? Most of the time we just write that none. But many times the conflict of interest may not be none. And you need to understand why it may not be none in certain cases. People don't understand its significance, but it has a lot of impact. If later on it was found out that, okay, there was a conflict of interest and they have not revealed it while publishing their work. And it can have a big impact on the career of any faculty. You know, in the later part of their you know uh, career, basically, so it can have a direct direct financial relationship. For example, you are doing some con consultancy project, for example, in direct direct financial, where it is related to the job, stock ownership, grants, patent. Basically, if somebody is funding you some grant, or you are doing some consultancy, or taking some honorarium, or you are investing somewhere, right, which is related to some company, you know, which is working in that area. So. If you are you're supposed to disclose the name of those companies which are giving you honorarium, which are giving you consultancy, and you have to mention that, okay, from here I am giving the consultancy, but I have no direct conflict of interest regarding that. So all these things are supposed to be the part of conflict of interest statement if you are having some direct or indirect relation with any of the uh, company which is you know, associated with you in some other, other way or the work which you are publishing actually. Now, what is peer review and how you are supposed to respond to the reviewer's comment? So once you submit their work to the uh, journal, it takes some time, you know, for the editor to assign it to reviewers. Sometimes editor-in-chief, you know, will himself, you know, reject your work directly, you know, by considering that, you know, it is not relevant to their journal. So what do you see in this cartoon, basically? This is just to, you know, make you aware that, you know, this is you holding your manuscript. And there are different people, you know, like holding different tools and weapons, making sure that you should not be able to reach at the end of the goal. So th their intention is not to block you, basically, but they are the different editors or reviewers or, you know, people who are involved in the reviewing process of your manuscript. So don't take it negative. They are not the people who want to block your work from publishing, but they are the people who are responsible to make sure that your work quality gets improved and it gets public more and more so that once it gets published, it, it, it's of the, you know, highest standards. Okay, so that people can appreciate it. Yeah. So publishing a wrong manuscript or uh, a raw manuscript or an unedited manuscript is, is not good basically, okay? So, so most scientists regarding the new streamlined peer review process as quite an improvement basically. So what actually happens, you know, when you submit your work for publication, so you submit your work, then editor-in-chief or the associate editor who is involved with that journal, they will check the basic requirement, whether your publication is meeting the basic requirement or not. If it is not meeting the uh, basic requirement, the editor will reject it maybe, or will say, you know, you just revise it, you know, again, or if it is meeting the basic requirement, they will send your manuscript to the reviewers. They will assign the reviewers, at least two to three reviewers. Some journals are highly stringent. They may assign your work to at least three to four reviewers as well. And then once it is assigned to the reviewers, 
then comes the role of the reviewer. So it may take a week or two. Sometimes editors are very fast, depending upon the journal, you know, guideline again and how much busy is the editor. But this process can take anywhere from one week to two weeks at the fastest. But some journals are really poor. They do not assign it even for a month. And sometimes you have to ping them down, you know, that please, you know, look after our manuscript and assign it to the reviewers. If you don't hear them from in two to three weeks, you should write to the editor and push them to send your manuscript to the reviewer. And you can see it on in the online portal of the journal, whether your manuscript is still lying with the editor or it is already sent to the reviewer. And then once the uh, reviewers are assigned, uh, assigned, the job of the reviewer is to thoroughly review your manuscript without any biasness. If they are related to you in some or the other way, because the world is so small, if somebody is working in the same area, people know each other, right? Then the reviewer has a, a right to say that there is a conflict of interest and I know the person, I cannot review this work. They should straightforward say no. That is the best way. But in the but if uh, they don't know the person, then review, take the work, take the assignment, and then they thoroughly review your manuscript. And based on the quality of the work, they uh, judge the quality of the work, and then they can make a you know suggestions or recommendation, and they submit their comment to the edit associate editor or the editor in chief. Based on the suggestions and the comments by the reviewers, editor in chief will make a decision. If it is satisfactory, generally they uh, send it for major revision or minor revision. After major revision or minor revision, if the uh, if you are addressing the comments properly in a rightful manner, your work can be accepted with the journal. And this process can again take, you know, if you are lucky, it can happen within a month and sometimes it takes two to three months. But it should not take more than that. But if the reviewers are really concerned about the quality of your work, or if they think that you are not able to do some novel work, and you are not able to address the problem, they may give the uh, very, you know, uh, uh, you know, you can see the drastic comments basically, which can lead to the rejection of your work. And sometimes it can go to revision as well. And then after revision, it can be accepted. But if they reject it, then at this stage, you can make a call. You can have some backup plan with you, like the priority wise, which next journal you want to go for. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, you should not go for more than one journal at a time. But once it is rejected, then you can plan to submit your manuscript in the another journal. Now, what reviewers are actually looking for in your manuscript, what do they want actually? So this is a plot between, on the right hand side, this is a plot between technical quality versus the novelty of your work. We all know that, you know, Whatever we are doing, we are looking after the novelty aspect. If the work should be really novel, then only we can publish it. But you just imagine a situation where your work is not novel and uh, it is not even technically equipped, right? What, what will happen in this case? The manuscript is bound to be rejected by the reviewer, okay? So the manuscript should have the strong hypothesis, originality, it should have the clear progression through the paper and the data should be well presented. But just consider a situation where the work is novel, it has a huge translation significance, but the technical quality is still poor. Then the it is questionable whether this kind of work will be published or not. There are chances it can be accepted, but it can be rejected as well. Now just assume a third situation where the technical quality of your work is high, but on novelty, your work stands poor. So this is also a situation where publication of your work is questionable. It may or may not get published, depending upon your luck factor. But there is a fourth situation where the novelty of your work is very good, and at the same time, the technical quality, like the methodology you have used, the presentation you have adopted, the statistical tools you have used, everything is perfect. So under these chances, of ch the, the chances of uh, publication is very high because your manuscript is standing high in terms of novelty, is standing high in terms of technical quality. Now, how to respond to the reverse comments? Most of the people don't understand this is the art, basically. In science also, you have to apply the art, the art of responding to people. If you don't know how to respond to the people, then, you know, it's difficult to address the reviewer comments and difficult to get your work published. Even your work is highly novel and it's of good quality, good standard. Just imagine a situation 
where reviewer is asking a question that the method and device paradigm the author proposes clearly wrong. Reviewer is, you know, saying that it is wrong. Then, this is one way, like you are responding, yes, we know, we thought we could still get a paper out of it. Sorry. So do you think this should be the way of responding to the reviewer? This is a very blunt way or the inappropriate manner of review, uh, addressing the reviewer comment. Just take another situation where a reviewer is asking a question to the authors that authors fails to reference the work of Smith et al. who solved the problem 20 years ago. They're asking you to, to refer some article. Then this is one way where you might be referring, uh, addressing this comment. <laughs> We didn't think anybody had read that. Actually, their solution is better than ours. Again, a most inappropriate way of responding to reviewer comment. This should not be the way. The more appropriate way to address these queries, those comments, is the reviewer raises an interesting concern. However, as the focus of this work is exploratory in nature and not performance-based, the validation was not found to be of critical importance to the contribution of the paper. So this is how you are supposed to address these comments scientifically, technically, in the more respectful manner. The another way, you know, the reviewer where they are asking to cite this paper, the reviewer raises an interesting concern. However, our work is based on completely different first principles. We use different variable names and has a much more attractive graphical user interface. In this way, you have denied their comment in a very respectful manner, and you have also justified how your work is better than the work proposed by the Smith at all. So you have to be smart enough. You should learn this art, art how to answer the questions, address the reviewer's comments, okay? Now, these are some of the review assignments which I thought I will share with you. These are just some of them. Every day we are getting, you know, one or the other articles for reviewing to us you know, from different journals. This is the Journal of Neuroimmune Pharmacology in which area I'm working basically. So, and then there's another journal, Journal of Ethno Pharmacology. Some of you, I'm sure that might be receiving a lot of invitation from different journals where they might be asking you to review the manuscript on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is the additional work for which uh, we generally don't get paid basically, right? This is just a social work, you can say. So we have to maintain a balance because out of our busy schedule where we are dealing with a lot of administrative things, our classes, our grants, our projects, student guidance, and then a lot of other administrative work in the department and the institute. You have to manage all these things as well. So it's challenging, it's difficult. So you need to make sure that you don't accept all the invitations, but yeah, you just accept some of them which are relevant to your field. Because as a scientist, this is also your scientific responsibility to review the work done by the authors, by some scientist, and then give them some of the fruitful suggestions so that their work can be published, you know, in a more refined manner. This is another journal, you know, where we have uh, uh, journal of the pain research. And then this is the life science, basically, which is one of the very good journal in our field, basically. So these are some of the publications uh, from our lab, which we have published in the past uh, few years. This is the journal, you know, pain, which is one of the very good journals, basically, you know, in our area. Impact factor may be around seven or eight only, not more than that. But it's very difficult to publish in this journal because it's a society journal and the reviewers are very tough, very tight, uh, and, and it's really, really challenging. Then one of the other publications from my point of work was published in the Nature Neuroscience. Then this is another clinical journal in which we publish one of our work is Anesthesiology. Another society journal, very difficult to publish. Then this is also society journal, ACS Chemical Neuroscience, in which you know we have published the work done by one of my PhD student, Ankit Unyal, who is now doing his postdoctoral research from John Hopkins, Baltimore, Maryland, USA. Then these are some of the other publications from our lab. This work was published where we have, you know, knocked in one gene, you know, into the uh, rat MRGC receptor instead of that. Then this work was published in the PNAS journal, which is again, you know, very good journal, you know, in the field of, in general, you know, science. And this is life science. So there are a couple of publications just to show you, you know, that what we have done in the past few years. So that was all about the publication writing 
how to you know write about publication and then how to make sure that you know you are addressing the, addressing the reviewer comments in the rightful manner so the next you know part of my uh, uh, presentation will be about the grant writing which i believe is very very important you know in today's area of you know today's area of basically you know academic award so i understand that some of you might be belonging to a different background like political science or you know economics or maybe mathematics background but some of you might be from the background of you know like science where you know universities institutes they want us to bring the funding because our most of the work is experimental wet lab work where we need uh, funding to purchase the equipment just like in my work also i i, I cannot you know do the research if i don't have the funding so i am depending on the external funding to carry out the different projects in my lab for that i have to approach different funding agencies like department of biotechnology indian council of medical research and science and engineering research board so but i understand not every faculty not every discipline they they, they, they will be needing this but at least you know we should have a basic understanding you know, about the grant writing how it is useful and how it should be done so what is basically grant grant is a mechanism by which an agency awards money to fund a research study or the other activity such as an education program also sometimes a service program even if you are not a uh, science person you are working in the political science background or you know education background or some other field basically there also you can write a grant basically to to uh, some international you know funders or the national funders or some government agencies as well you know where you can do some societal work basically you can run some educational workshops and programs basically okay so it's not only for the experiment but you can conduct the workshops and the awareness program as well with these grants but for that you should know how to write down a effective grant so why apply for a grant i think this answer to this question we have already discussed but again some of the key points are that if you have a grant you can advance the scientific knowledge in your field and you can advance your professional career as well in our institute in iit bhu these days promotions are very challenging now the days are gone where promotions can happen you know just without any you know uh, much effort and you will just promote you in a timely manner it is very clear cut that you have to publish a definite definite number of paper and at the same time you have you also have to secure the external funding if you don't have definite amount of external funding no matter how much you are publishing no matter how you are good academically how much you could is your teaching feedback people are not going to promote you even the experts who sit in the interview from other institutes like other iits or iscs or you know other big institutes they also look mostly at your research profile rather than the teaching or the academic profile so these are the issues in most of the you know big institutes right now this may not be the same in, in universities or other places but yes it is one of the component which is required for your professional growth a grant means that experts in the field acknowledge your idea as important and worthy of public or private support they agree with your idea okay this can be funded it means enhanced prestige of your institution if you get the grant then the reputation of your institute will go up okay uh, that means this institute you know has people who can bring the money to the institute which will support the institute as well from the overhead part of the money institute can also do something a grant means a contribution to the financial health of a department school or agency of course if i talk about the united states or europe there everything runs on grant if you don't have the grant your job is gone gone most of the faculties they are not tenure track this tenure track concept is slowly coming in india as well but in uh, abroad it is already there so if you want to get a faculty position in america basically it is highly competitive you need to demonstrate that you can bring the funding you can bring the grant if you can bring the grant initially they will support you for 3 years or 4 years if in that time period you can bring the funding or the grant to the institute they will support you otherwise they will say you tata bye bye go to your home because you cannot bring the money to the institute so with that money with that fund you will get your salary if you are hiring some manpower post docs they will also get the salary from them and even institute will take a big chunk of money from your grant to run their manager resources and that's why how they run the big big institute like john hopkins harvard stanford 
from these monies basically. So grant is a big thing. When we talk about the other countries in India, it is still not that uh, big issue. But here also, you know, you need the grant, even if not for your salary or not for your student salary, but at least to do the research, to buy the consumables and the equipments. And uh, it means a new opportunity for your research assistant. Of course, the manpower which you have hired, and it means a new program that otherwise can be too expensive for your institution to support and implement. Nobody is going to give you one crore or two crores, you know, if you want to establish a new facility, new kind of system which you might have used in the uh, other part of the planet. And now you want to establish that in India, in your institute. So none of the institute has that much amount of money. For that, you have to approach the external funding agency, write a grant, write a program, and then tell them that you want to set up this facility at IIT BHU or at some other institute in your university, in your institute, and then say that, okay, with this, you know, all the nearby institute will also get benefited. Now, why start now? If we are talking about the grant writing today, if some of you are related to this, you know, why, why start now? This is an important part of your professional growth strategy, and it's a long-term range plan. The most important mistake, you know, which most of the people do, is that they start working on the grant when they receive the notification from the funding agency. Call Aya, Indian Council of Medical Research Ka. Okay, uh, that we have to, you know, submit a grant in one month or two months. Then people will start writing the grant. You can never succeed. It will be just by luck or by chance if you can get it. But any grant which is not well designed, well planned, well thought and written by heart, the chances of success are always less. So it's a long range plan. You should spend at least a few months in penning down your you know, thoughts, your ideas, hypotheses, or the problems you want to address. Okay. Then build individual credentials, build a track record of funding so that people trust that, okay, this candidate has a potential to uh, carry out the research. He has handled multiple grants in the past. Work on teams with more experienced researchers, you know, make a team, make a collaboration, build the collaborations, develop a plan for long range and personal development as well. So now, you just look at this picture. What this dog is trying to do is trying to climb the tree. Do you think this dog can climb the tree? No, never. Because its objective is not meeting with the objective of the, in, in this case, the funding agency. So your interest funding is always equal to your interest plus the interest of the funding agency. It doesn't matter how good you are at particular field. If that particular field is not matching with the interest of the funding agency, it is they are never going to fund your research. So you, if I talk about India, India can have a completely different mandate from United States. If I talk about the Indian Council of Medical Research, so the diseases which are peculiar to our country, they may not be you know peculiar to the states or Europe. So one should identify the problems, which are the problems of our country, in which our government is interested, our government is ready to fund, ready to invest, and then start working in that area and then make that your area of interest, basically. So no matter how good your idea and how well written your proposal is, sometimes the fund, funding agency to which you are applying is not interested in your project, you will not be funded. So sometimes it is not about the quality of writing or the quality of idea or the novelty. It is about matching the interest of the funding agency with your proposal. So identify what they want actually, read their guideline, go to their web page, and then plan for the funding. Next is the what are the different government organizations basically, which uh, gives the funding basically for the research. So there are several government agencies in India uh, which funds the research, different kind of research. And uh, one of them is BIREC, DBT BIREC, which is a very good program. If you have some idea and you have some industry partner, sometimes without industry partner also, you can approach the BIREC. They have called time to time on their web page where if you have some idea which is ready to be translated, then BIREC is a very good you know platform where you can translate it. They will give you fund and you can bring it to the market. 
DRDO, which is Defense Research and Development Organization. If you have some, you know, uh, idea basically where you want to develop some products or some technology which can be useful for the defense people or for the defense related work of the country or some medicines which can be helpful for the uh, soldiers. So those kind of research can be uh, funded by the DRDO. CSIR, Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, they also fund Department of Ayurveda, Yoga, Ayush. So this Ayush is a big organization which funds a lot of research related to the traditional system of medicine, naturopathy, Yunani, right? Siddha. So you can collaborate with the doctors, you know, Ayurveda doctors, and then uh, try to connect uh, the traditional medicine with the modern medicine and try to answer some questions, develop some new formulation products for the treatment of untreatable disease in case we are working in that area. Department of Biotechnology, Department of Science and Technology. Then TIFAC, Technology Information Forecasting, Scientific and Engineering Research Board, ICMR, Indian Space Research Organization, and different, different state government. Like in case of Uttar Pradesh, it is UPCST, Uttar Pradesh Council of Science and Technology. So these are the government organizations which funds a lot of research related to the, you know, uh, uh, you know, like in your area. But there are private foundations all as well, which many people are not aware of. And let me tell you, it is not only private foundations which are present in your country, but you can approach the foundations which are philanthropic foundations which are situated outside your country as well. You can approach them through email, you know, writing them, expressing your interest and sending them your proposals. You never know, you know, somebody, you know, may be interested in your proposal and they can fund you from America, Europe or Canada, Australia, from anywhere. So it is possible. So these are the different foundations which offer the grant to individuals. Sometimes they offer the grant to the institutes and other non-profit group as well. So generally only independent foundations and community foundations provide the grant to independent investigator. There's philanthropic funding where people don't disclose, you know, like who has funded, but sometimes this kind of funding are also available. Another important resource of funding is the CSR funding, which many people are not aware of, which is corporate social responsibility. So as a mandate by government of India, any private firms, any private companies, you know, they have to keep certain percentage of the CSR funding. So whatever money they are earning from our country, a uh, part of that they have to invest in the uh, corporate as a corporate social responsibility. So they have to invest it into the societal work. They can give it as a funding to any organization, to academic institute or to as an individual as well to answer some questions. So that can also be tapped, you know. You can contact those organizations directly. Corporations, there are large corporations, you know, like Microsoft, you know. Microsoft do a lot of funding in India. Bill Gates, Gates found the Get Foundation, right? They, they fund a lot of like uh, uh, social science projects as well in India, public health projects in India, not only in India, in different parts of the world, which are in crores, basically, in millions of dollars. They're funding those kind of projects also. To cooperation, they provide a grants for research project that advance the interest of the company. Sometimes they are interested, you know, in some specific area. So if it is matching with their, you know, interest, they can fund you like anything. So this is just, you know, uh, one uh, industry project, you know, which I wanted to share with you. It's one pharma company. They wanted us to, you know, test one of their uh, product, you know, uh, in uh, animal study and in the uh, human human models as well. So they, they have contacted us, you know, for conducting these studies in the home population. So this is sometimes, they, sometimes companies may contact you if they know your expertise, if they know your strength. And sometimes you can also approach them if you have those capabilities, those infrastructure with you. So these are the different things which you need to understand, you know, like before making the grant application, what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses, what are the opportunities which are available, and what are the threats, like in terms of competitors or in terms of operating platform, in case of lack of media support or failure of not executing the project. So all these things you are supposed to prepare in advance. Okay. Now, if we talk about what are the types of projects that receive the funding, definitely, you know, the projects of high scientific caliber, you know, or which are sometimes which are initiated, you know, by the investigator. And they, if they are unique, basically, in nature, 
they are having high chances of funding. By law, funding agencies cannot support a project already funded or pay for research that has already been done. That you should make a note. Funding agencies are always supposed to support the projects which are novel, which are not executed earlier by anybody else. So they also look for the uniqueness and they also look for the novelty, just like the journals look for the publication. So these are the different government schemes which are uh, there in India, basically. So one of some of them are you know run by the CSI, some of them are run by the DST, DBT, DSI. So depending upon you know your area of research, you can just go through their web page and try to find out which is more relevant to your area. Okay, competition will always be there whenever you are submitting your proposals, you know, for funding. Uh, the competition will always be there, basically. Okay, so funding agency receives thousands of applications for each application uh, received round, and funding on the first stamp is always very, very challenging, but it is not impossible. So, when you submit 10 grants, then you can expect that maybe out of 10 grants, you may get a grant funding, you know, by some agency. And even the best idea sometimes will not be funded unless it matches the interest of the funding agency that I already told you in the beginning. Competitive ideas must reflect both contemporary thought in a field and also match should match with the uh, requirement of the funding agency. Then it needs more one more planning. You should learn about your institution, you know, what are their policies in terms of, you know, like if they can help you in the proposal development and they can uh, help you, you know, in expediting the process, preparing the budget. And you need to learn, you know, how much time your institute takes. One second. Uh, Deepa? So, okay, sorry about that. So you need to understand how your institute can help you in making a timely funding application. So you need to plan in advance because you need several paper and endorsement certificates from the institute as well. Abhi, abhi class mein, das mein call karenge, abhi class mein abhi. So if your research proposal involves human subjects, then you need to plan ahead of time by your institutional review board. And uh, uh, that approval also needs time. If you're working on animals, then you need to take the approval from the Institutional Animal Ethics Committee. All these th uh, things needs time. So plan it properly. Then searching for the grants, that is another important you know, uh, thing which you have to do. So go, go to the different web pages, find out the funding agencies, and look for the calls. For example, CERB, Science and Engineering Research Board. They always have a, a calendar in which they mention that in which time of the year they will open which funding call, like a startup research grant or the core research grant or the women scientists scheme, whatever is there by DBT or DST. They have their calendar fixed in a year. So you need to stick to that calendar and see, you know, when their grant call is open so that you can apply for that. Okay. So this we have already discussed, yeah, but... Uh, when you are writing a grant, be prepared to write, write, and write again and again. Sometimes, you know, a proposal is uh, very well written, but at the same time, it has to be really clear, focused, and precise. If your proposal is poorly written, then, you know, it has a chances that, you know, you may uh, lack the funding, even if your idea is highly novel. And these are some of the uh, very, you know, important tips for the grant writing. Follow an outline. Prepare your figures, tables, and images which you want to put in the proposal beforehand. Be accurate and use any technical words you want to use accurately and correctly. You're supposed to use the sentences which are not less than 70 words and not more than 23 words. The sentences which are too short and which are too long in nature, sometimes they lose their meaning basically because Sometimes readers, they do get confused what message you actually want to convey. So an uh, optimum length of sentence is always better whenever you are writing whether a publication or a grant. Use the paragraphs which are uh, clear, which are uh, informative. 
and all, always think about the style in which you have to write it. So go to the guidelines as well. You know, different funding agency have some certain guidelines, so you have to follow that. And know when to avoid the highly technical language. You might be working in the field of medicine or pharmaceutical or some other field, but you need to understand that the person who might be reviewing your proposal, he may belong to a certainly different background sometime. So sometimes you have to write it in a more layman language so that anybody can understand it. So if we talk about the research proposal, it must be hypothesis driven, just like the publication. It has to be concise and it should be focused. The most important part of any grant proposal, any research proposal is the preliminary data. This is a mistake which most of the people does when they are submitting their grant proposal. They don't have the enough preliminary data with them. So without pilot data, uh, the funding agency is not going to trust you because that fund, that pilot data act as a proof of concept. This suggests that, okay, this, uh, this idea of whatever they're proposing has some value and in terms of, you know, uh, like it is working out or not working out. So preliminary data, pilot data always gives the confidence to the reviewers, to the funding agency. Okay, this idea may work out, whatever authors are or the, 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 this person is proposing basically, okay? And spend most of the time, you know, on the experimental plan. It is very, very important how you're going to address particular problem. Present a strong rationale. Why you think this, uh, th th this problem is relevant and it has to be, you know, worked on. Describe the detailed research plan, describe the methodology in detail, and always provide a rational plan for failure. Most of the time, many people, they just talk about the positive, positive things. They never think about the failure, and they do not even talk about it in their grant proposal. But the smartest people, you know, what they do, they always talk about the limitations and failures along with they, they also talk, uh, one second. अभी एक मीटिंग में है थोड़ी देर में बात करेंगे आपसे मीटिंग में सो सो ऑलवेज टॉक अबाउट द लिमिटेशंस पोटेंशियल फेलियर्स एंड आल्सो द अल्टरनेटिव प्लान इफ दिस हाइपोथेसिस इज नॉट वर्किंग आउट दिस पर्टिकुलर एक्सपेरिमेंट इज नॉट वर्किंग आउट देन हाउ यू आर सपोज्ड टू मूव फर्दर सो दैट अल्टरनेटिव प्लान्स टॉक्स अबाउट यू नो दैट यू आर वेल प्रिपेयर्ड to take the challenges which are lying ahead, even if this project will not work out. Most people like this thing. Hypothesis, what is it? It's a proposed explanation of a phenomena which you want to study. So while proposing the hypothesis, you have to be very specific and focused. Do not just use a technique to address an experimental area without a well-formulated hypothesis, okay? And then these are the different components of the grant proposal. So whenever you are planning to submit your grant, you are supposed to talk about specific aims in your grant proposal, which can be anywhere from like one and a half page to, you know, like one page, where we will talk about, you know, what problem you want to address and what are your specific aims and objective. And then the next is the background and the significance section, which can cover like almost one or one and a half a page section where you will be talking about the published information in that particular area where you are proposing your work in support of your hypothesis. So that will be the backbone of your research proposal where you are uh, suggesting, okay, uh, like this is the problem I'm stating here and this is the already reported literature and this is, you know, uh, why this particular area is important and significant to work on. And then next comes the preliminary data or the pilot data, which can cover next one page of your, you know, grant proposal, where you will be presenting. And it's a very important part of any grant, which allows the reviewers to understand the approach you plan to use, whether it can actually work or not. So these days, you know, our funding agencies, they ask for the preliminary data. And then next comes the experimental plan, which can be the another important part of your grant proposal which can go up to like two pages section which allows the reviewers to understand how you will actually execute this project so it has to be really strong and if the methodology is not right then it will raise a concern to the reviewer okay this person doesn't know 
how to answer this particular question. And this can also lead to the grant rejection. And then the, you know, in the specific aims, as I discussed, you know, you have to give the enough background on the problem. Then you spell out the specific aims of the proposal. And sometimes you also have to talk about the further sub aims. For example, in aim one, you have a broad objective. And then in that broad objective, you can further talk about the further sub objective, like aim 1A, 1B. And then in aim two, you can talk about aim 2A, 2B, something like that. So that can go from like anywhere from aim 1 to aim 2, aim 3, aim 4. In the background, you are going to provide a good overview of the field and you are trying to address the gaps in the knowledge which are going to be filled with your proposal. So what are the gaps in this particular field and how your proposal is going to fill those gaps in knowledge. So this will set up the whole stage for your grant and that will give the confidence to the uh, funding agency and the reviewers, okay, this person knows that these are the limitations, these are the challenges and uh, this is how he's going to sort it out. In the PME data, as I mentioned, you know, it, it all, somebody, you know, may not have it always, but if it is, it is going to help you a lot because it will give the confidence to the reviewers that the technique, you know, is working for that particular project and the data that shows that the hypothesis is sound. So, this is, uh, but many people spend so much time on the background and PLMA data basically, and they uh, run out of, you know, stem by the end, which is, uh, you know, uh, this, this part of the, you know, uh, project, the last part of the application, is the methodology part, basically. And then in, the, in this part, basically, you should provide the outline for your experimental approach, so where you can restate each specific aim at the beginning of each section, and then you restate the hypothesis for each specific aim, and then always provide the rationale for each specific aim, and then provide a detailed plan for the experiments. Many times what people are doing, they're spending a lot of time on the hypothesis on the introduction part, but they are taking less care of the methodology part, which is the main heart of your grant proposal and then talk about the expected outcome what we're expecting out of this particular subset of the experiment for example if aim in 1a you're suggesting to study the effect of particular drug on particular marker so what are you expecting and then you also talk about the alternative plans in that so so that's all and this is the overall summary you know what we have discussed you know so far like have the funder in your mind and then know your audience and then you know uh, start writing. So these, all these things we have already discussed you know, in the previous slide. So this is the overall, you know, summary in the form of cartoon just to tell you how to, you know, write a good kind of proposal. So this is just one example, you know, which I want to share with you all. This is one of the grant which has been awarded to us by Council of Science and Technology, Uttar Pradesh, Lucknow, where they have awarded us one project entitled Development of Perfectly Acting Nano Formulation of opioid drugs for the treatment of neuropathic pain. So there are funding opportunities which is available around you, but you just have to tap the right, you know, table. So uh, this, these are the students, you know, who are working with me as master's and PhD student. And these are the different funding agencies who have supported our research projects over a period of time, like Indian Council of Medical Research, IIT, BHU, SERB, MHRD, IBRO and International Association for the Study of Pain. And uh, thank you so much to all of you for your uh, kind patience for bearing with me for these long three hours. And uh, if there are any specific question, I would be very happy to answer. And one more thing I would request all of you to uh, kindly uh, give your feedback, you know, uh, uh, after, you know, this uh, today's session. So I would love to hear from you, like how we can improve further for future presentations. And if there are any specific questions, feel free to ask. So, yeah, and no questions? Okay. I think everybody's tired after a long day, I think. Okay. Uh, excuse me.
Yeah, yeah, we can take the question one by one. So, uh, yeah, yeah, please, please tell me. Uh, uh, Akansha, I think you have some question, right? Uh, yes, sir. Actually, yeah, please, uh, yeah, that was related to uh, research, writing, and uh, publishing. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, uh, it has happened to me that uh, I have submitted. I have two questions regarding this. First, I have submitted uh, my paper in a journal and they reject with some review comments. Okay. Uh, but uh, uh, those were uh, review comments which I can tackle in my area. So, I politely write them and, uh, of each and every review I addressed with citing some references. And uh, after, they have rejected that, but still I can't, um, I uh, mail that to the editor that mm -hmm. these are, although it is rejected, but these are my points because the review points I can tackle and I politely write each and every uh, comments, the uh, mm -hmm. comments on each and uh, every review comments. Mm -hmm. So they actually accept my paper and my paper got published in that journal. But yeah, the yes. same thing happened uh, for the another journal that was an international journal. And their reviews were not that much sound. And uh, means that their review, uh, they have just few points. And when I tackle that with more politely and with more reference, but the response were, was like, uh, if we have rejected, there is no need to send this paper back. Yeah. So... I think uh, I have a question because their answer was so means uh, the first one answered me politely and the paper got accepted because I tackled the uh, comments also. But in second, they didn't read the paper and uh, means my comments and the, the so how look, I tackled. Uh, Akansha, so that's a very good you know, point which you have raised today. So look, everybody is human, right? And uh, it depends upon who is sitting on the chair, right? So many journals have the guidelines very straightforward right away, you know. Like if some of the paper has been rejected by the reviewer or the editor once they rejected, you know, they have very straightforward guidelines. They are not going to entertain it again, right? Yes, but sir. some journals, they are more flexible. You can say they are more generous, you know. And editor-in-chief has the full power, you know, to reconsider. So, but I think as an author, you know, it is our right to basically, you know, approach the editor, you know, based on the comments or if they are rejecting our work. So I think what you did was, you know, uh, really good and commendable, you know. This is how one should approach, you know, because most of the people, you know, when they hear the rejection from the journals, they, they don't approach. They just take it away and then they go to the next journal, right? But I think this is a good way, you know. Sometimes you no, can actually, just... Uh, I uh, when I re uh, write them, I was not expecting that they will accept yeah. it. But they, and second time when they reject and I write uh, to another in another journal, they were very harsh in their yeah. comments that right. uh, it is not means. So I was just I have just concern that to which journal I should write, which I should it's, not. Yeah, so it, it's it's a very subjective question, you know, and very difficult to answer your question, what you're asking, which journal to uh, write and which journal not to write. Because, as I mentioned, you know, it depends upon the person who's sitting on the chair. Sometimes the person who's sitting on the chair is more kind, more considerate, right? But the person in the same journal, you know, might be the another person other day, right? Because editor-in-chiefs, associate editor, they keep on changing, right? Today, someone is editor-in-chief, tomorrow someone else will be there, right? So it, this is very subjective in nature, right? But yes, as an author, what best you can do, you can try to approach the editors or the editor-in-chief regarding your concern, what you feel is right for your work, and then let them decide what they want to do with it. If you think your work is good, it will be accepted. If not in that journal, then in some other good journal. But I think public publishing is, is more important. The work should come in the public domain rather than you know run, running behind you know, like big, big journals. That is what I would suggest. Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Excuse yeah. me, sir. Yeah, please. Uh, thank you so much for such an enriching session. It is really very helpful. Thank you. Uh, very structured way you have explained how to write the abstract and how to 
structure the paper. Sir, so, I am just asking you, other than writing paper, suppose uh, if a person is preparing to write a book and the materials are ready. Mm -hmm. I'm from economics background. Uh, so suppose uh, I, I'm preparing related to Bihar, the agriculture economy, agro industry and something mm -hmm. like that. So suppose the materials are ready and uh, chapterization has been done. So in case of publishing that book, uh, um, shall I go independently with a publisher? D does it make any difference uh, with a different kind of pub something? Can you guide me? Yeah, I got go your point. So, yeah. yeah, yes, I got your point. So uh, I think uh, you, the, your portion is, you know, if you have like material and the content ready with you, like in terms of some book you want to publish, right? Content you want to publish in a form of book, right? And uh, yes. like how to decide like which publisher to go for, right? So hmm. there are different publishers, you know. So again, you know, I would say, you know, you, you try to see, you know, which publisher, what kind of guidelines they are having. Sometimes, uh, you know, some publishers we know like Elsewhere. Elsewhere is a good publisher. Taylor France is another good publisher, right? Nature, Nature is also another publisher, basically, right? So there are a lot of publishers which are, you know, there and they are they are good, basically. But at the same time, you want to, refer their guidelines, what are their guidelines. Some publishers, you know, sometimes they offer the uh, honorarium as well to the editors and the editor-in-chief for publishing their work, basically, right? Sometimes they, they give the honorarium to the uh, authors as well of particular book chapters, right? So that provision is also there, which, which I, you know, know from my colleagues, you know, who are publishing too many books. So, so it completely depends upon you, basically, you know, like, uh, that publisher, you know, what uh, what kind of, you know, uh, like books uh, they are publishing in past and uh, what kind of audience is there who is referring to their books. So it completely depends upon you. But yeah, always try to stick to the good publisher, like elsewhere, you know, Taylor, Francis, Billet, Nature. There are some publishers which are substandard and uh, not even substandard. They, they are basically, you know, like, uh, I would say they, they, they don't have any quality, basically. They will just, you know, write you emails and then we'll ask you to communicate your work to them. Just ignore those kind of you know publishers, I would say. They stick to the standard publishers. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Because your work is valuable. You want to get it, you know, recognized. Yes, sir. Any any other questions? So I think there's a message for all the participants that, you know, from the from our Office of Teaching Learning Cell, that uh, uh, MCQ test is mandatory for all the participants. It will be conducted on 21st March at 4 p.m. Okay, so kindly, you know, uh, make sure that you, you attempt this MCQ test as well. And I would request all of you to uh, kindly uh, give your feedback because that is where, you know, we want to learn from you and we want to improve further, you know on our, you know, future, you know, like sessions. So uh, feel free to, you know, uh, reach out to me. My email ID is mentioned on the web page of IIT VHU. If you have any queries related to any of the content, uh, feel free to get that to us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.